Hello everybody, Mike from the Rewatch Project podcast here and I am a lifelong Star Wars and Star Trek fan watching classic Doctor Who for the first time. So I've reached The Survivors, which is the second episode of the second serial, I believe is the uh, the correct terminology as suggested to me by the helpful folks on the comments of the last couple of videos. So thank you for that and please keep commenting. I'm in a new venue today. Um, I am in my man cave dash garage uh, dash uh, midlife crisis taken form. It's not a basement though, so I am breaking a few of those geek cliches, but we are not far off that uh, today. So uh, again, just want to remind everybody that I really appreciate comments, uh, likes and subscribes, all the usual YouTube goodness, but I don't want to hang around. I'm really enjoying Doctor Who and I am really looking forward to continuing on. We got like an, a, a hint of Daleks. There was a POV um, of uh, a Dalek, well, there were a plunger of you. Uh, I guess you would say, of the Daleks. We got a hint of them in the last episode. Very alien-esque, creepy, abandoned facility with uh, strange things afoot in the last episode. So I'm very much looking forward to getting into this. Again, I know little to nothing about Doctor Who. I grew up in the 70s and the 80s, so it was always there in the background. It was always ubiquitous. But being a lifelong, dyed-in-the-wall sci-fi uh, movie and TV geek, there has always been a big Doctor Who-shaped void in my knowledge, and I'm trying to rectify that now by watching this. So these are pure, unadulterated initial reactions. So uh, let's get into it. Let's watch The Survivors, the, third, the second episode of the second serial, The Daleks. Let's go. just want to mention some of the YouTube comments. People mentioned that the, um, the theme wasn't actually done on a synthesizer. It was done analog through lots of copying... Uh, and pasting and taping and editing. So uh, yeah, that's pretty impressive. Survivors, here we go. Creepy, spooky. Terry Nation is a name I know, uh, just from, you know, third party fandom. Okay, so we're picking up where we left off from. Again, great use of sets and space. Um, you know, you go down one corridor and then you move the camera back down to the other end and you're in another corridor. It's a, it's, it's a, a science fiction style walk that works very well. Corridors, caves, polystyrene rocks. We ought to find some mercury here. Ah, yes, yes, I recall now. They're trying to find the, uh, they're trying to get the 1.21 gigawatts to get back in time, aren't they? Oh, measuring equipment. Look at the needle. It's past the danger point. Oh, dear. Yes, yes, that is... How do you explain the buildings? They're intact. Neutron bombs. Yes. Again, the thing I really like about Hartnell is um, he's an open-faced actor. You know, a lot of actors talk about how on stage, obviously, you know, you need to project. Uh, even in film where there's a wider frame and the camera's set back a little bit more, you do need to project. But with television, it's incredible how you... If you're thinking something, it shows on your face. There's a subtlety, um, and you don't necessarily need to perform. And I think Hartnell can do that. You know, you can really see um, the the thinking going on behind the face, and it tells a story. And I think that when you've got somebody who, um, on a show where, you know, you probably have to tell more than you can show because of budget, it's really great to have that in your arsenal of tricks. And um, it's a little bit like, um, again, the Star Trek fans are going to show here, William Shatner. Sometimes people make fun of him, but the flatness of a lot of that dialogue only really comes to life, particularly that expositional science fiction kind of um, techno babble is the term. And when you've got somebody with energy or intelligence or wit or just some kind of theatrical, theatrical joie de vivre, it really makes that stuff come to life. And Hartnell's got that. How much Interesting. How badly? Oh. So they're getting rid of all the skin jobs so they can keep all the tech. You need drugs. Grandfather, do you mean to say that you risk leaving the ship just to see this place? Oh. You fool! You old fool! Well, again, the hubris of the Doctor here, you know. He does seem self-aware about it, though. I don't know. Is this the beginning of a journey of humanising for him? Or at least getting used to playing with others. But, uh, yeah, that's a uh, bit of a dick move there, Doc. John and I are going back to the ship. Now come along, child. All right, carry on. Fine. Child. How far do you think you'll get without this? I'll give that to me. Time. We should be looking for bombs. I like the trauma of this relationship. Oh, child, if only you'd think as an adult sometimes, it's a... Oh, very well, very 
Yeah, Hartnell's doing some good work here. They all are. They all, they know their characters and they're playing them right. Oh, here we are. It's the Daleks, guys. First appearance. They, they, they're there. I mean, obviously, they're the most iconic villains here. And it's interesting because when you go back and watch TV shows, often the characters aren't quite there. You know, they evolve. But these are fully formed. These look and sound like Daleks. Um, and, you know, again, growing up in the 70s, and I think I can only imagine it being even more so in the 60s, in Britain, um, the shape of the Dalek, the silhouette, the voice, it was as ubiquitous um, as the shape of um, the mini car uh, or... Um, the, the post box or um, Big Ben, you know, it was this uh, great, iconic, extremely British, charming, but kind of deadly, inhuman thing. And uh, here they are. Immediately. Love the use of point of view there. You just know that they're not to be trifled with. And truly, truly alien in design as well. Whoa. Legs. Negative effect there. My legs. Look at that movement. Your legs are paralyzed. You will recover shortly unless you force us to use our weapons again. In that case, the condition will be permanent. You two. And also just the fact that they've got these different layers that move at different times means that, you know, on the one hand, it's, you, we've all heard the jokes, they can't go upstairs and things like that. But but there is a kind of movement and a sense of control that they design, the aesthetics, um, the inhuman sort of fascistic design of these things really can elicit. I can't use my legs. Again, right, right up to the camera there. The faces have to be your canvas, you know, when you don't have a huge panorama of set available. Man, they're having a bad day. How about you, Barbara? Do you think there's someone inside them? <laughs> Good question. And I don't know. Point. This is this is all new to me. We haven't any idea what's inside them. And just for those in the know out of universe so not in the show are there people in them or are they just completely remote control how do they how do they work because they look great um and they look really slick there's nothing rickety and kind of um you know ed wood about these things they seem functional and they seem quite stout and uh sturdy and again i don't know what the mythology is of these whether there's creatures in them or not i i, I mean i know daleks i know what they are i know exterminate exterminate um, but really, that's about it. So, uh, yeah, really interesting to see where the mythology and the world building goes here. They are in quite the pickle. Again, the focus pulls for live recording in a set with actors and action and props. Um, Break in the old man, Paul Prisoner. Wow. Drugs left outside the TARDIS. TARDIS. He is becoming delirious. Ah, yes. I do not understand his words. Something else is at work here. Athens and I are travellers. Responsible for his return. He will have our lives in his hands. That is enough. Then we must. It's nice to know that even uh, even Vidalics uh, assume gender. And uh, it's all he. But uh, again, this is this episode's token hand wave, 1963. They must be discussed. Disgustingly mutated. The Disgustingly mutated. And knowing that depend on it. Yeah, Hartnell's doing good stuff here. He's really committed. He's not doing sci-fi acting, you know? He's not kind of camping it up. Why didn't you sit down for a No, no, no. I'll be all right. All right. Oh, yeah. Oh. Up in there, Ian. Oh, good. Is that youth, maybe? Are you all right? Drugs. I, I can't be certain. But it does give us That's a interesting because a, a bit of a line flub there uh, from Hartnell. And I've said before that, you know, this is completely understandable and 
quite admirable that it doesn't happen more often because of the practicalities and the mechanics of the way that they might leave my understanding of how they shot these episodes but here it doesn't matter because he's got radiation poisoning so there's actually kind of uh, an in-universe reason for why that that happened hell it might even have been a choice what do i know they're mutations so it wasn't our captors who left the drugs behind the no. killer robots and they mutations i must get that drug quickly I mean, good on Ian. You know, uh, he obviously is frustrated with the Doctor and, you know, quite rightly blames him for a lot of the issues that they've got here. But his first impulse is still to help. I mean, obviously he'll be helping himself and Barbara and Susan as well, but he seems like he cares, so I think that tells you a little bit about the character. Daleks insist that only one of us goes. Then I'll have to take the key and I'll have Where to go the name on Daleks come from? The door opens. No, it's a dev off. derivation of that. There are 21 different holes inside the lock. There's one right place and 20 wrong ones. If you make a mistake, you'll... Well, the whole inside of the lock will melt. That, that was a tough line of dialogue. There's nothing else for it, then. Come on, let's see if I can walk. And trying to deliver that dialogue whilst being no, hysterical no. as well. I mean, that Take cannot be easy. You must leave now. I'm not well enough Like, you should have thought about that before you stunned me, you bastards. He's a trooper, isn't he, Ian? What a man. Oh. Come on, you can do it, buddy. Go on, Susan. You gotta step up, girl. Put your radio down, stop listening to your long haired pop music. And you keep. Are you ready? Yes, all right. The thing I love about the Daleks' voice is uh, it's really difficult to imagine them having casual conversations uh, because they're just so intense all the time. Uh, I mean, there is a slight variance in timbre, but. Um, yeah, they're very, um, very tightly wound, I would say. Take your cardigan off if you're so hot, mate. She's getting worse. And there's about five or six separate awesome elements, design elements to the Dalek that for any other creation would be the one thing. You know, you've got the plungers, you've got the guns, you've got the heads, you've got the bulbs, you've got the, um, half ball motifs throughout them as well you've got the shape of them they're just such a great idea and they're such a perfect sort of fascistic form as well uh you know um the borg in star trek are a great example of this because they're so uh you can't reason with them and just the idea that they're just these things essentially hovering or on wheels that they're almost like a crowd control thing you can just imagine them rounding people up you know that's what they do that's their bag Difficulty in keeping my eyes open. Yes, I'm about to say. Sounds like a hangover. All his fault. This spooky forest. Little Red Riding Hood, Grimm's fairy tale vibe going on here. Again, a lot of horror, a lot of horror elements. Lot of, you know, slightly, you know, James Whale, Todd Browning um, stylings going on here. And it's interesting as well because I believe that there was from the comments that, that there was a little bit of controversy about the Dalek storyline because of this question of the educational agenda of Doctor Who. But um, but I did see some discussion about that. I don't think it's necessarily an open and shut case about as to whether um, Doctor Who was had a specific educational mandate. Um, I think that there seems to be, um, from what I've seen, not complete consensus over how all-encompassing um, that mandate was. Um, and it's worth saying as well that one of the things that's really interesting about this experience is, um, and I don't say this sort of arrogantly um, because it's actually kind of embarrassing, um, but I'm kind of used to being the expert in a lot of in a lot of geek sci-fi things, you know, a lot of shows, um, particularly the 60s through to the 90s, you know, your Star Treks, uh, Twin Peaks is another show, The X Files. Uh, I know a lot about these. You know, these are shows where I've I've I've, I've read. The making ofs. I've watched the bonus features. I've read the magazine articles. I've seen the episode many, many, many times, and um, it, it's kind of interesting. Um, an interesting experiment in vulnerability to allow myself to sort of enjoy my ignorance in this and let other people be the experts and take me on the journey. So, um, bit of a tangent there, but I thought that was worth mentioning at this point. Again, the close-ups while they're running, probably almost on the spot to create the illusion of size of set is great. And I think that that's one of the things. These limitations not only force them to be creative with things like the, the TARDIS, um, but also adds to the charm. I think sometimes when um, there was a bit of a conversation about this on the comments 
I think sometimes when you've got all of the resources in the world available to you, um, you bypass imagination and you bypass charm and everything's too slick. And sometimes, you know, a bit like music, it's the rough edges that give these things their personality. And I think Doctor Who is a wonderful uh, example of that and should be celebrated uh, for that, not derided. Come on, Susan, you got this. Fight the urge to be hysterical. Come on. Although I think I'd be fairly hysterical, to be fair. Great sound design as well. Goes a long way. So what do they want? Why do they want the drugs? Is it just to study it so they can uh, counter it or weaponize it in, in some way? I'm, maybe I missed that. This is the danger with reaction videos. Sometimes you talk over a really important bit. If I miss anything, please let me know. There it is. Great sense of direction. You don't want to lose the key. I bet that's used as a plot device frequently. The Convertardis itself. Protect her from the radiation. Not that she can just stay there, I guess, but... Ah, sweet, sweet drugs. She is a child of the 60s, after all. Again, the outside of the doors. I don't get it. Is that... Is it some sort of masking technology? That makes it look like a uh, the regular TARDIS doors? Next episode, the escape. Um... Yeah, really enjoyed that one. I also think it's cool that, that that one, they didn't feel the need to have like a giant cliffhanger on that like they do on previous episodes. It's just that's the end of this part of the serial and then we're going to move on to the next one. So uh, yeah, really enjoying this, still into it. I think the thing about this episode that jumped out at me, aside from just the fact that we get the introduction proper of the Daleks and all of the great design elements, both visual and um, from a sound design perspective, because of course, I've talked before about how, you know, the BBC came out of radio and um, I think that you, the use of sound is incredibly important. They got, they really perfected that. They were world class when it came to that, and obviously they've got that in their arsenal because there are limitations with scope and size and budget that they have to make sure that um, everything that's within the frame is as sort of interesting and dynamic and opulent as they have the resources to achieve. But at the same time, they need to use these additional resources like the sound design and and the great open-faced acting abilities of the performers as well to really convey these things and I think they do a great job of it I think that all of the cast were good in this and Hartnell was really wonderful as well uh, you really get the sense of exhaustion and stress and the stakes you know our characters they're really they're really having a bad day here and they're really uh, in a pickle and you get a real strong sense of that so yeah I'm really looking forward to the next episode again Appreciate feedback, comments, likes, subscribes, all that good stuff. And I'll be back very soon with the third part of the Dalek serial. And I will see you out on the comments page. A quick reminder, by the way, uh, that I'm on Twitter at Chin Stroker. That's uh, Chin Stroker. That's because I do a podcast called Chin Stroker versus Panther. That's where that name comes from. And I will be back very soon to watch more Doctor Who, which I am very much enjoying. So uh, let's do this. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye.